Recognize Mr. Kimball to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This <clears throat> amendment allows the uh, Higher Ed Coordinating Board to do an impact study after this bill is, is passed. It also uh, allowing the institutions of higher learning to make reasonable efforts so that each employee of that institution whose position would otherwise be eliminated as a result of the implementations um, of this legislation is offered reassignment to a position of similar pay at the institution and it moves the effective date to January 1, 2024. Mr. Speaker, I move adoption. Mr. Campbell, send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? The chair has none. The amendment is adopted. The chair recognizes Mr. Mr. Johnson of Harris. Mr. Johnson of Harris to speak in opposition to the bill. The chair recognizes Ms. Niave Criado to speak in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. This is a regretful day in this chamber. This chamber that has, before today, prioritized the strength of our public universities. This chamber who, in the past, has allocated billions of dollars into the Texas University Fund to ensure that our state remained, quote, intellectual capital of the world. And I stand before you in opposition to this legislation, legislation that goes contrary to the votes of this chamber to support and uphold our public schools of thought, legislation that threatens to defund our public universities for working towards our stated goals of 60% by 30. Today's a regretful day for those of us in this body, this body that in 2015 pledged to, quote, vault the standings of our public colleges and universities into top ranks. This legislation unravels the investment that this legislature has made to public colleges over generations, investments that have taken our state to hold the largest number of tier one and tier two research universities in this nation. This legislation threatens those victories all out of what? Fear of diversity, fear of equity, of inclusion? Do we fear these three because we perceive a threat? A threat to what? A threat to whom? Diversity is not a threat. Equitable access to education is not a threat. Inclusion is not a threat. We turn our cheek away from the real threats that our communities face. The threats of gun violence, threats of poverty, housing insecurity, the threat of illiteracy. Not even a generation ago, men in positions of power used institutional violence for political and educational control. Mexican Americans, black Texans, and other communities have been terrorized, abused, neglected, and wrongfully profiled for decades in this state. And why are we back at square one? After all of the civil rights victories that we have overcome and won, this legislation is rolling us back to a time when not even water fountains were equally accessible. Let's be honest, because this legislation is telling us that Texans fear diversity. This legislation shows us that folks are so afraid of inclusive practices in public universities that they are willing to go as far as defunding our public universities. And yet, we sit here with each other as colleagues looking at each other in our eyes, working side by side, 
while voting for legislation that hurts students who look like me, students who look like our colleagues. The choice we are being offered here is clear. We are either supporting equality through diversity or punishing it, censoring it, suppressing it. And I ask you to reflect on what DEI practices means. What is the absence of diversity? The absence of diversity is white supremacy. The absence of equity is inequality. The absence of inclusion is segregation. This legislation cuts our legs for, from underneath us and blames us for not standing taller. Is the goal of this legislation to curtail the increasing number of young Latinos and black students enrolling and graduating from public universities? This legislation punishes students looking to pull themselves up by their bootstraps for needing a little extra support. This legislation defunds public universities who look to provide that support. And it, I ask you to consider the harmful effects of what defunding these universities means for helping the least of these. And that's why I oppose this legislation. The chair recognizes Mr. Johnson of Harris in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to all of my <clears throat> members and colleagues that have worked and fought so hard to make education of higher in institutions a better place, I don't think that we've done that today. Calling or saying DEI is something that it is not is, where, is why we are here today. The misinformation campaign has said to us that DEI takes away the opportunity for qualified candidates to be hired versus based on race, based on creed, versus based on sexual orientation. DEI is not a mandate. The department itself simply offers the opportunity for people in this state to have a better understanding of the institution that it is saying that we are inclusive. You are welcome. You are welcome to come to this institution because for so many years we have forgotten how we got here. From the time education and colleges and universities in this state were founded, for over 100 years, they were only for white people to attend, which meant Hispanics, Asians, blacks, and sometimes even women could not go to school. Only for the last 40, 45 years have we been inclusive. And there's still problems. There are some of you in this room that have tasted segregation. And while you saw it, but for those that had to live it, it's a lot different. And we're pretending as if everything is all good now. Everything is all better. We're saying we're looking for opportunities for everybody to have an equal and fair playing field. DEI never mandated not one university to hire anyone based on their skin color. DEI and that department simply said to those that may not have thought they, they were welcome, you are welcome to come to this institution. We will embrace you. They hire people based on that. But now we're here where we're saying we don't want that. We no longer want you in our institution talking about race, talking about gender, talking about sexual orientation. We simply want you to come, be ready, and to do academic work. Well, I offered an amendment today that made sure you had a playing field that was equal. And somehow, some way, we overlooked it and moved on. I'm saddened by the fact that while we do understand one another and we can talk and we have dialogue and we get to a point where we say, I do understand you, but we still simply ignore one another and move on because we're worried, we're worried about the next election. We're worried about being primary 
And that's so unfortunate because the people of this state will lose. This state will lose hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars because DEI no longer is in place to simply say we embrace diversity. It does not mandate that you create it. It says that you're simply embracing it. That's what DEI is. It simply says to those that may be hearing impaired that we will put subtitles so that you could see. That is what DEI is about. It simply says that when you are in a wheelchair, that we will create a ramp so that you can be included so that you feel welcome to come to our institution. That's what DEI is. For the, for, for the, the visually impaired, that when you create Braille, that is what it's for. It has nothing to do with race, but we keep talking about race. But we're forgetting who we're hurting because it also says to the people with disabilities, you are welcome to come to our institution. We welcome your mind, we welcome your spirit, we welcome your everything about. So while we're sitting here and we have gotten the misinformation, then it's time that you get the real information. Remember, doing this will hurt this state by the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to your institutions. And I hope at some point that we wake up and realize that the votes that we take simply because somebody asks us to can hurt the ones that we truly love. The chair recognizes Mr. Sherman in opposition to the bill. Mr. Speaker, members, before I begin my speech, I, I really want to express my sincere gratitude for this House, Republicans and Democrats, who prayed for me. You prayed for me and you prayed for me fervently. Some of you came by my desk and prayed for me. And I'm grateful for your prayers. I also want to thank you because some of you prayed that I would come back. Thank you for bringing me back at this late evening to be here with you tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This morning as I was preparing my breakfast at the hotel, it's a buffet that they provide and Representative Chairman Burns, as I was looking over the food and putting things on my plate, I heard a woman's voice speaking and she was describing the food that was on the buffet. And she would say, I heard her say, this bacon looks good. And then she got to the millens and she said, the millens look good. She got to where I was at the oatmeal. She never described the oatmeal. She never described the hash browns. She described the eggs. I realized she never described the sausage. She never described the grits. She only described the things that she saw to mention to the person who was with her. And I wondered in my mind, why is this middle-aged white woman describing the things in the buffet like a realtor does when they're showing you a house as if you don't know this is the kitchen, this is the master bedroom. And then I realized, Representative Tote, the person she was talking to was blind. He couldn't see anything on the menu. He could only depend on her to describe what was on the menu, meaning that he could only eat what she had described. Let me express my deep gratitude for the opportunity to address this very respected group of my colleagues. You've worked hard to get here. 
And I know this opportunity and privilege was not afforded to my grandfather to be able to stand here and speak to you. The chair or the author of this bill said that we love diversity. We want to make sure that no one gets preferential treatment. Legislators are sent here, I believe, to address problems and concerns and issues and challenges and or opportunities in our society. But I want to know for all clarification, what is the problem that we are addressing in this bill? What is the challenge that we are addressing in this bill? Normally, as you know, we here in this body are very deliberative. We don't respond quickly to issues like Uvalde and Allen, Texas, El Paso, Santa Fe. We don't respond without being very thoughtful. That's it. How long has DEI been a problem? When did it become a problem? What group or advocacy group came before this body or members to say DEI is a problem? This bill says we must close DEI offices. I want to remind you again, earlier it was said, we love diversity. Who is we? What is your definition of love? Meaning, how do you show love? What is your definition of diversity? What groups are included in diversity to you? Same old, same old. I implore you to ask. Do you perceive DEI as an intentional, intentional program? Our Sergeant of Arms, our Sergeant of Arms of this very house is the epitome of DEI. And she is exceptionally qualified, but she is not the first woman to have been more than qualified to be Sergeant of Arms. No progress without being intentional. Racism in our past was intentional. Integrity must be intentional. Inclusive must be intentional and diversity in a world that has a historical past of being intentionally racist must be intentional. You know, intentionality will make you consider other people. Consider that there's sausage on the buffet too. Consider that there are grits on the buffet too. Being intentional, being intentional will make you listen even when you don't agree with a person who is addressing you. How many constituents live in your districts are black? The speaker, whom I have a huge respect for, stated at the time he was campaigning for speakership, and I quote, in Texas, we set politics aside and we work for the benefit of all Texans. Leadership, he said, must be diverse. It must look like Texas and give a meaningful voice to the different people from across the state. Imagine a voice that would not have to beg or plead to be heard. A voice like the 32% of African Americans who live in your district, the 22% of African Americans that live in your district, the 22% of African Americans that live in your district. What if they didn't have to beg and plead and ask you to just consider them? The NFL 20 years ago this year began the Rooney Rule. And it only said they had to consider. Before then, there was no African-American as a head coach, no African-Americans in the front office. That first year of the Rooney Rule, there was still no African-Americans because all they had to do was just consider them. So that means, Mr. Speaker, as I come to my close, and I thank you so much because I, I just believe when I came here, people would not vote party, but they would vote for the people. So I know this is huge, 
because here we vote party, not people. I just ask you to consider the people in your district that may not look like you. God bless you and thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The chair recognizes Mr. Kimball to close on the bill. Mr. Speaker? Ms. Collier, for purpose? Will the gentleman yield for a question? Will the gentleman yield for a question? Yes, ma'am. Chair Kempel, do the provisions of this bill prohibit a grant recipient from seeking an amendment, exemption from, and or alteration to the terms of an existing grant to ensure compliance with the contracted and or eligible services. No, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'll move passage. The question occurs in passage of third reading of SB 17. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Mr. Kimball voting aye. Have all members voted. There have been 83 hours and 60 nays. SB 17 has passed the third reading. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Ms. Collier, for what purpose? I'd like to have that last question placed, reduced to writing and placed into the journal for purposes of establishing legislative intent. It's already in the legislative intent. Uh, all discussions on SB 17 has been entered into the journal, Ms. Collier. Thank you. Thank you. Members, the speaker's desk 